December 7, 1941, I was living at the International House on the Berkeley campus, and I heard somebody down below calling up to me. They said something about Pearl Harbor, and I said, what, what harbor? Uh, explained to me what had happened, said, turn on your radio. We have witnessed this morning the attack of Pearl Harbor and the severe bombing of Pearl Harbor by Army planes, undoubtedly Japanese. It's no joke, it's a real war. And during the rest of the day, people began to call up to me and ask if I saw the enemy planes overhead, if I saw them coming. So I was there with my binoculars looking out over the bay, trying to find out what was coming. And of course, they didn't come that day, and they didn't come at all, but we didn't know that at the time. I don't think these fears were irrational. You could, within the next 30 to 40 to 50 days, see a number of American ships aflame offshore. The Japanese submarines were scouring the whole area. In the aftermath of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the San Francisco Bay Area, already on war footing, took on the feel of an armed camp. In the week between December 18th and 24th, eight merchant ships were attacked by Japanese submarines off the California coast. Outside San Francisco Bay, the fishing fleet now required a Coast Guard escort. Above the Golden Gate, Army Coast artillery, replete with massive underground bunkers, pointed westward, awaiting attack. Inside the bay, an anti-submarine net stretched across the bay's entrance. The atmosphere of war was all-consuming, and nowhere more so than in the shipyards of Richmond in the East Bay. Facilities were completed in 1944 to make Richmond shipyards the world's largest, covering 880 acres and four and a half miles of waterfront. The Kaiser shipyards were a battlefield of World War II, and the shipyards were one of the most effective weapons that the U.S. developed. Henry J. Kaiser is a genius. He's a typical, typically American kind of genius. Here we have a person who's a high school dropout who gets a big paving contract in Cuba in the 1920s. What's he know about paving roads? Nothing. But he knows about bringing people together. And that's when the next period of his life came, which was building the great dams, uh, Hoover or Boulder Dam, uh, Bonneville Dam, and then Grand Coulee Dam, which was the largest public works construction in the history of man. And they get the contract, because he says that same technique of, of dam building could be used uh, for quick shipbuilding, and then he becomes a great shipbuilder. On April 14, 1941, as piles were being driven, Buildings constructed, a mobile crane lowered the first keel plate, and a cheer arose. By the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor, Kaiser Yard No. 1 was up and running, constructing awkward but easily built cargo vessels. Construction of a second yard to build yet more Liberty ships was already underway, and within a year, two more yards for building other vessels followed. There's a photograph of yard three under construction. And there are ships in the shipway, but in front of the shipway, instead of there being water, there's land. The ships are landlocked. They'll get that open later, <laughs> but right now they wanted the place to build a ship. The strategy was simple enough, build ships faster than the enemy could sink them. One of the things that Kaiser did was to find ways to mass produce these ships. And that meant to mechanize on the one hand and to de-skill on the other. Job simplification and the training of a half million persons were without doubt the most incredible achievement of the entire shipbuilding program. So at the lower end of the order, they got rid of riveting because that was a skilled job. So they did that with welding. Here's a little song that one of the boys in the shipyard cooked up. Ready, girls? Take it away. By the middle of the war, nearly 25% of the employees at the Kaiser Yards were women. Heralded in the popular press as Rosie the Riveter, 
in the shipyards, Rosie was a welder. I went to the employment office and got my social security card and signed up for welding school at Richmond High School from four to eight in the morning. Each learned to do his special task skillfully, and the combined results turned out ships faster than any generation had imagined possible. It was about two weeks, I think, they said I was ready. When they first start building those Liberty ships up in the North Bay, they got it down to fewer and fewer days, and pretty soon they had it down to uh, an average of 17 days. And then came the four and a half day ship. On the morning of the fourth day, the launching anchors were hauled aboard, and hull 440 was made ready for her maiden splash into the bay. They had three shifts. When your eight hours is up, then somebody's standing right behind you to walk in your space. Somebody who was working down there said that if you dropped a quarter on the deck, it would be welded before you could pick it up. When Hull 440 slid triumphantly down the ways, a cheer went up that echoed round the world, a tribute to the determined men and women who had accomplished the amazing feat of launching a 92% completed ship in four days, 15 hours, and 27 minutes, an all-time record. When these kind of records would reach the Japanese war office, they didn't believe it at first. They thought it was impossible that anybody could be producing ships at, at this rate. Building the ships to win the war would require more than 100,000 workers at the Kaiser Yards alone. Another 45,000 were employed to the north at Mare Island. Another 22,000 at Marin Ship. 35,000 more at Hunters Point Naval Shipyard in San Francisco. And another 35,000 at Moore Dry Dock in Oakland. Nearly overnight, it seemed, San Francisco Bay had emerged as the greatest shipbuilding center in the world. People started to come in from all over the country, and that still wasn't enough. Kaiser had to go out and recruit. And they actually sent trains out, and they recruited people. They had these trains that they put them on and sent them uh, back. So we watched those people pouring in, you know, hour after hour, day after day, and stood on our front porch and waved them into town. The biggest impact on the bay would be the sudden dramatic increase of the population surrounding it. Between 1940 and 1945, the Bay Area's population exploded, outpacing even Los Angeles and increasing by more than half a million. People were living in cars, people were sleeping out. There was terribly unsanitary conditions where people made camps and they built outhouses that overflowed during the rainy season. There was a terrible smell to the bay. I don't think that we had complete sewage systems in. It was just awful. It took your breath away. The Oakland estuary supposedly was a huge fire hazard at the time because there was so much oil and gasoline material floating around in it there. The great port of San Francisco was naturally the jumping off place for most of the stuff moving west. Intersecting with unprecedented war production, was the process of getting troops and supplies to the war itself. By July 1945, the Army's San Francisco port of embarkation shipped out a total of one and a half million troops and everything they needed to fight. Tanks, landing craft, and endless tons of food. That same month, under tight security, another cargo arrived at Hamilton Field, where it was quickly shuttled south to the Hunters Point Naval Shipyard. At dawn the following morning, the cruiser USS Indianapolis slipped under the Golden Gate Bridge and departed the West Coast, carrying the components of an atomic bomb. Three weeks later, it was detonated over the Japanese city of Hiroshima. On August 14th, the deadliest war in human history was over. <laughs> 